All right. The next one actually is, I think, going to be quite interesting for all of us. Um, it's the presidential roundtable. Mind the gap, changing roster of new actuarial skills. With so much being discussed, I'm sure there's a new skill set requirement every time that we need to you know, move ahead in future. So I'd li like to call the panelists on stage, please. Ms. Micheline Leon, President of the International Actuarial Association. Ms. Kalpana Shah, President-Elect, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, UK. Mr. John Robinson, President, the Society of Actuary. Mr. Frank Chang, President-Elect, the Casualty Actuarial Society. And of course, Mr. Arunachalam, President, Institute, and Actuaries, Institute of Actuaries of India. The session is going to be chaired by Dr. K. Sriram, Consulting Actuary India. Please, sir. Good morning to all of you. At the outset, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the panelists here. And I would also like to thank the Institute for this opportunity to uh, moderate this panel discussion. A good starting point for this discussion will be a statement that was made yesterday, uh, that the actuarial profession is at a point of inflection. So whenever a profession is at a point of inflection, the roster of skills that will be required tomorrow is going to be very different from what it is today. Uh, if I can think of an example from the past, about 40 years ago, actuarial science and financial economics were two distinct disciplines. But today, financial economics is an integral part of mainstream actuarial work. So coming to the present, uh, let's get engaged in a conversation with the eminent panelists here about what the future holds for us and how we are preparing ourselves. My first question will be on how do we identify the skill gaps or what is the gaps in the skill sets that are required for tomorrow and what they are today. So what are the primary skill gaps we are looking at? I would like to address this question to Ms. Kalpanasha. Right, so I think um, technical, let's face it, we, we've, um, we've probably covered a lot of the technical skills amongst, um, amongst the many years we've had actuaries, amongst the many years we've had insurance. There's obviously newer skills being developed that we need um, around, we've talked about it, we're talking about data, we're talking about climate, we're talking about um, a number of new and developing areas. Now, how you do that is really, we, we need to get out there and see what there is for us to be doing. Where are our actuaries going? What are they working in? And not just what are they working in, but where do they want to be? So strategically, where do we want to be as a profession? Do we want to be in one, one area, experts in one technical area, or are we envisaging ourselves as more than that? And I think as far as we are concerned at the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, it, we're looking at um, a wider, broader place for actuaries. We're looking at um, where, where can we develop? Where can we be in the future? We've done a lot over the years of giving information to somebody to make decisions. And, you know, I want us to be the decision makers. So what, do, what skills do we need for that? Um, we, in the Institute and Faculty, 
as well as the technical development, um, as well as reaching out to our members and having various working groups and boards and committees to develop that information. We also have a committee um, about vision, skills, mindset, and domain, and it's specifically about getting people to think about where we want to be. I mean, the world is evolving. There's so many opportunities. The skills that actuaries have are so broad. Um, and I think many of the actuaries, we saw with the talent show yesterday, actuaries are very versatile, yeah? And so they can be involved in much more front-facing things as well. So that's what, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kalpana. Uh, the next question is as to how we are gearing up to close this skill gap. Uh, what are the initiatives that we can put in place and what are the initiatives that are, have been already put in place to, to uh, close this skill gap? It can be on two dimensions, one in terms of just updating the curriculum in the training program, and the other dimension can be in terms of upskilling the qualified actuaries. So from your standpoint, Ms. Michelin, uh, how do you think the actuarial associations are gearing up to meet this challenge? Mm. Uh, we, we talked about where we wanted to go. Uh, I think we also uh, want to hear about where people are expecting us to be, where they need and where we can be the, the most useful. Uh, and uh, I uh, go back then to the technical challenges that we're going to uh, face with all this climate and so on. And uh, we really need to uh, expand to uh, take, uh, get closer to other professionals. Uh, we've uh, been able to uh, uh, use the knowledge, use the data that we had and project it, but we, uh, it's new data with more variability, there are more challenges. And so we need to uh, basically not just rely on what we can see, but uh, get the, the knowledge from the people that, from the expert, uh, the, uh, the, the pure scientists who, who look at what's happening in, on the planet and take from there, uh, talk to them, and, and not just be isolated, but being part of this global community uh, and with the knowledge, uh, get further with what we can do. And, and for that, I mean, there's a, an effort, collective effort that we need to, to get through, where we uh, basically can uh, summarize from an actuarial perspective what this new science that is developing tells us. And from there, uh, basically uh, uh, s uh, making it in a words that People, that actuaries can understand, and then use that for, the, for our future projection. So there is, a, a, I guess, an openness that we need to other uh, 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 scientists, if you want, other, like, the, 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 we are in applied science, so we need to understand the phenomena that are happening in, in, right now under our eyes, and that will be the challenge of the future. So how are we uh, doing this? I mean, there is definitely some of that work that is being done as people are uh, connecting with other uh, professionals. Um, so uh, I'd say let's continue in, in, in that direction. We also will need to uh, get m uh, more into communication so that people understand what we're doing. And uh, so it, all of this is to be developed uh, uh, but we're getting into, and there's more and more um, conscious, conscience, conscious, consciousness of, 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 of that this is a need uh, that is uh, coming up and that we, we need to address it. Thank you. That's the great insight. Yeah. Can, I, can I add to that? Yes. Uh, I think actuaries need to be curious. We need to think of ourselves as not just actuaries, but actuarial scientists. And a scientist is curious, right? We want to know how things work. I remember when I first started as an actuary, we had a very large data set, maybe 100,000 rows. And we would run this macro through it. And some of you might be smiling because you know how long that would take. 
And so Excel would sit there and crunch, and we'd go out to lunch, we'd come back, and we'd say, oh, okay, here's, you know, here's the result. Oh, wait, something broke, I gotta rerun it. Or we used Microsoft Access, any of these old kind of antiquated tools. We have to be curious, is there a better way of doing these things? Some of that stuff can be done in Python or R in half an hour, 15 minutes, much faster than the tools that we use. So addressing these skill, skills gaps, we need to look at what is cutting edge these days and what is free. R and Python are both open source. There are so many tools that are at your fingertips that you can use to accelerate the way that you work. So I would say stay curious, stay up to date. There's nothing in the exams that says, once you become a fellow or once you pass all the exams, you stop learning. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I write my notes because I like to think before I talk. Um, in terms of what the SOA is doing in this regard, uh, we, we tend to get our information for you know, what is needed from employers. Um, I have a little saying, in order to be an actuary, you have to be employed as an actuary. And therefore, we have to respond to what the employers expect of us. So in that regard, I'd say, oh, in that regard, I would say um, there are two main areas where we have seen gaps. One is data science, and the other is soft skills. Data science is new. Soft skills, unfortunately, is not new. And so in terms of what the SOA has done, uh, we have upgraded our associateship curriculum to include uh, much stronger elements of data science than, than there were before. And we've introduced, uh, it, through online learning modules, uh, some AQEQ, soft skills, communication, uh, empathy, those sorts of things that we think are necessary for, um, for, for, for young, young actuaries to have. Um, it's not entirely clear to me that that is the best way to deliver that sort of training, but at least we're giving it a shot and we'll see how it turns out. In terms of upskilling of qualified actuaries, which was the second part of your question, um, you know, in, in, in conjunction with the data science that the students need to learn and need to, need to do, managers also need to know enough about that to be able to provide good direction to their students and have expectations of what, you know, what the work should look like. So we provided a data, uh, we provided a certificate, two of them related to data, data science. Um, one of them is called data analytics. That was the first one that came out a few years ago. And again, intended for people who are fellows like me and who need to give instructions. And then the second one, which I think is very important in this world of data science and a lot of data, uh, you know, it's one thing to have a lot of data and have the ability, as Frank was saying, to, you know, first of all, store it, and secondly, to, to process it in a reasonable amount of time. But one of the big challenges of having lots of data, potential challenges, is that the data has inherent biases, especially when they may be related to human behavior. And if, they, if the object that you create uh, whether it be an AI mod, may AI object, or a regression model, if that has biases, such as, for example, it's unfair to women for, for whatever reason it might be, then I say the job is not done. And so we also, so, so the second um, certificate that we put out there is called the Ethical and Responsible Use of Data. And it's meant to address those types of issues. Uh, I, I believe those issues are going to be with us uh, from here on out, uh, the way the world is working. Thank you. Can I add something to that last point? I really love what you said about ethical uh, ML. I think that's, that's something we all need to think about. There's something called the ethical matrix, which is a way of testing ML models and AI to see if it's ethical, and, and that is available, and you can actually look that up online. Uh, I would also recommend um, reading this book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy, <laughs> I'm gonna mess up her name, I think it's Kathy O'Brien. Uh, her cousin actually works at Uber, but 
regardless, it's a really good book, and it talks about some of these biases of, of mathematical algorithms. You know, Microsoft's face dis detection had one point done really horribly with with other faces, like with uh, Asian face, with uh, Chinese faces, they would say, please open your eyes. And with dark faces, they couldn't just, the face facial matching just wasn't working. So I think that's really important. And then since I am from the CES, I do need to say that we have a certified specialist in predictive analytics series given by the CES Institute. I was on the board that created those exams. So if you're interested in data science, you have many options. You have one with the SOA, and also the certification program with the SA, uh, CAS as well. Adam, would you like to comment? Yeah, I think um, embracing technology is a need of the hour. Um, we started with commutation functions, later we moved to Excel, and uh, now we are going to move, move to R and Python. It's not going to change significantly from what we are going to do. Uh, but then we'll have to adapt to the technology. Uh, the complexity, I feel, is more in terms of data science, uh, which is more a shorter term version of what we do, right? And, and hence, you know, I agree with uh, John and Frank in terms of adapting ourselves and re, uh, I, I wouldn't say um, it, it's changing ourselves completely, but making ourselves slightly different from data scientists, but at the same time, work with them, right? Now, we are the data scientists, but also we are slightly more than them. We are better than them. That will help. To do that, we will have to start with the data analytics and the data science fundamental. And that's where we should start. Uh, my, uh, I, I wouldn't say concern, uh, but a suggestion for the future is that we will have to be faster enough, you know, we'll have to be agile, in terms of updating our curriculum, uh, because the technology side is quite quite fast. It goes obsolete in no time. Uh, and hence, if we can make our uh, curriculum a bit more modular in terms of adapting it as we keep on changing, uh, that will be better. Uh, the other point I would like to add is that the business side of it, uh, you know, uh, from an Indian perspective, we are quite small in size, and mostly we are in the regulatory arena too. But for the last so many years, many of our actuaries are working as a regulatory signing actuary. But I think we'll have to move slightly out of that zone and, and be part with the business. So if we combine business and technology along with our technical skills, that would be better. So from an Indian perspective, yes, adapting to technology and adapting to business is what uh, we are looking at. Uh, but uh, we will take the best practices from the global uh, actuarial profession, uh, be it from the SOA, they have launched data science, they've also launched the IFRS 17, if I'm right, and then, you know, as Frank said, and from IFOA also, we had, we have had a wonderful discussion yesterday. I like what uh, Frank said in terms of calling ourselves as actuarial scientists. It's, it's kind of uh, synchronizing with data scientists, but also making ourselves slightly different. It's, it's a better way to uh, have a first level qualification as an actuarial scientist. That's my thought at this point. Yeah, there are some great insights that have emerged from this discussion. Uh, I think there is a corollary to this question on impact of technology. I just wanted to know from the panelists as to how we can use technology as an enabler for imparting actuarial education. I mean, some people talk about having a cloud campus and so on. Uh, so are there initiatives from the actuarial bodies about how to use technology as an enabler? I, I, what was I, uh, I thought I was assigned this one, so I prepared. Okay, apologies to those who heard me talk yesterday about this. So, uh, actuaries can benefit from using artificial intelligence in multiple ways. One of the most significant benefits is the improvement of risk modeling. AI can help actuaries identify patterns in relationships and data that may be difficult for humans to see, enabling them to make more accurate predictions about the future. AI algorithms can also be used to analyze claims data more efficiently and accurately, which can help insurers to identify fraudulent claims and predict which claims are likely to be paid out based on historical data. There's more, but one thing I can say AI does is they can also write responses to questions that panelists give you. This is from ChatGPT. 
So I, I think we need to embrace technology. Uh, I did talk about Python and other things, but I think we need to embrace not just the technology, but the framework that the, te not, that the technology gives you. All right, we have old technology like the chain ladder method, and at my talk yesterday, you heard that we can use the chain ladder method to predict how many phones that Google is going to sell. And I did that successfully when I was there. You can also use the ML framework for analyzing things. It's like that game of NIM. How many of you have played the game NIM with like matchsticks? Right, you got three matchsticks, five matchsticks, seven matchsticks, and any player can remove however many matchsticks they want. Anyone know the secret to NIM? You win that game if you know what the ending combinations are, right? Whoever picks that last matchstick will lose. All right, well then you know that configuration of if you have a matchstick in one row and another matchstick in another row, you already know what that outcome is. Okay, so you kind of have a framework for NIM because you know what all the closing combinations are. Why are we not taking actuarial problems and, in putting, and then putting them into frameworks where we know what the closing combination is? We know how to deal with chain ladder. We know in ML we have gradient boosting, we have bagging, we have all these techniques. We have isolation forests. We have tons of things that we do out there for anomaly detection. I hope someone out there is using an isolation forest for claim fraud because these techniques are out there. And we just have to go to any open listserv online, Reddit maybe, and just find out what is going on in the machine learning world and adapt those things into what we are already doing. If we can take our problems and use another framework to solve it, good for us. And that gives us the benefit of being adaptable, addressing skill gaps, and using technology. Um, I'd just like to add to that, Frank, and I agree with you that um, we already embrace technology. Um, throughout my career, computers were relatively new. We were programming um, models for reserving, for pricing. Nothing existed. Now it's easier because people, there are people dedicating to building these models, so we don't have to as much, but it's still a skill set actuaries have. Um, it's still something that actuaries are very capable of. I think the trick about this whole piece with technology is not about whether we embrace it. It's more about whether we're scared of it or not. And we are embracing it. The trick is, as actuaries, how are we going to be different? We saw a skit um, regarding AI the other day um, and the fear of computers taking over. Well, what's our edge? I mean, surely we're not paid our salary levels just because we're the same as computers. We must have something different. And our difference is how we articulate our judgment, our opinions. We've got to differentiate. We've got to use technology as a tool, but just remind the world that we've got so much more to offer and to be able to identify weaknesses in the te technology, but also support it and articulate it and make it understandable so that the world realizes how much we're needed. So, uh, so yes, effectively, use the technology as, as a tool. Uh, keep, have in our mind what we want the technology to do and what we can uh, get from it. Uh, don't lose ourselves in trying to, to do this job, more in terms of st strategically using it to our benefit. And that's, uh, I guess, what, what we're all saying here. But no, don't, uh, it's easy to get to forget uh, and, and get uh, involved in the mechanic. It's the thinking that is important in this respect. I, yeah, uh, I have another perspective as well. I know technology, uh, I think uh, for the benefit of others, you know, whatever that we do, we will have to use that technology in the best possible way. But from, from our own perspective, uh, how do we embrace technology in our, uh, not just curriculum, but also reaching out to our students, right? So, um, so we are a vast country in India, you know, we have sp so many states and you know, reaching out to students itself is difficult. Uh, so from, uh, from the Institute of Actuaries of India, we have uh, started a cloud campus or a digital campus as, as an initiative uh, you know, uh, recently. 
and that would be uh, catering to all the needs of the students per se. It would be it would be more a virtual or a digital platform. So, so I think we should also look internally. I feel in terms of how we use technology in in benefiting ourselves for the building of the academic capability, but maybe not just the academic capability post the qualification as itself, like how we can train, for example, in R and Python, you know, through our seminars, you know, we, we, we do a lot of webinars as well. So I think a bit more internal as well would help, uh, this, is, this is my suggestion. Yeah. Can I add to that? I love that response about India. So I visited two universities, and one of the things I want to point out to us is if we're not using R and Python, we need to get there sooner, because all of those students are using R and Python. The, the, I had a student ask me, are we still using Excel and actuarial? And, and I have that same problem in the, the United States where students see actuaries as a little bit behind because we're still using Excel and they're already learning R and Python. The universities are, are, are ahead of us in future skills, so we do need to make sure that we're rushing a bit. And I, and I think we do want to think about that next generation, especially here in India, a very vast country, lots of potential smart students. Yeah, just to, just to follow up on that, um, one of the things that the SOA did, I guess a couple of years ago now, was we added some advanced data analytics, advanced topics in data science. And the, 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 the questions result, there's a, the questions will have like a project where you are, the student is given a set of data, is asked to do an analysis. Um, one of the things about that is that there is no requirement as to which language to use. And so you can use R or Python, and who knows, you know, six months from now, some other new thing may come along. And so, so the exam itself is agnostic as to which, um, which software to use, which I think is a, is a good thing. Thank you. I think there are some very interesting perspectives which have emerged on how we can develop a technology-driven curriculum and how we can use technology as an enabler. Uh, so that brings me to the next question on a appropriate mix between soft skills and technical skills in the uh, actuarial skill set. So what are those soft skills we would like to emphasize for actuaries to be effective business leaders and thought leaders? Uh, I leave it as an open question. I would request every one of you to respond to that. Right. I, I'm sort of passionate about the soft skills. Um, having worked um, on technology for a number of years, but constantly thought I wanted to be the decision maker. I wanted not just to be passing information on to somebody else who possibly understood less about what I was talking about to make the decisions. And so in that piece, I was learning some basic things about how to make myself heard, how to make myself come across as somebody to listen to. There's some really simple things on watching people, watching the seniors, but I think it's sort of understanding where do you want your career to be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, and not just think, at, at the end of the day, it's not going to be an exam that's going to get you jobs after a certain stage. That, that will set you off, it will give you the basics, it will give you all of that. But then your trajectory is going to be a lifelong piece. You want to keep up with technological advances. We are actuaries, we like learning. But at the end of the day, we want to be listened to. So how do we be, get listened to? And think strategically, think about where do you want to be, where do you want your profession to be, how you can influence, those sort of things. It's not just about speaking nice, nicely, it's about being impactful. Um, I used to, you know, there, there's some easy steps. I used to present papers to the board and um, I learned over time you put some pretty graphs in rather than tables. You put different colors in, you know, you start that way, you go, oh, that seems to interest people. And then you gradually learn something else. I mean. I joke about it, and there's some, um, there's some stereotypes that, about women that I might fall into. I like talking, and I like talking a lot, and I like talking fast. So one of the things I keep telling myself, and I should be telling myself right now, 
is to speak slowly. There's um, gravitas and, um, you know, those sort of things. I might not do it at home, I might not do it, but there's certain pieces and the best people to learn from on those cases are the people who are doing the jobs you want to do. You know, they're speaking slowly. They're sort of saying less. They're trying to give you the main point with less information. They're not crowding you out with too much. Those sort of things, those sort of softer skills, um, I think they're invaluable. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, um, the way I put it, and if, you know, I, I agree with much of, you know, just about everything that's been said. Uh, the way I like to put it is that the value proposition of being an actuary is the ability to synthesize a number of things that seem to be disparate. So you have economics with biology, with mortality, data science, statistics, the law itself, the regulations. We are the ones who can synthesize all of that into a story, and this is important, a story that we can tell our employers that will inform them and help them make their, make their business decisions. So whether it's a pension plan or, or, or an insurance company, uh, participating, making sure that you are heard. Um, I, I like what you, you use the word influencing, and I believe that leading is influencing. And so yes, you want to have influence, but it's not gonna be because of how good you were at AI. That's not gonna produce that influence. And so that's a whole separate skill set, but you know, that, that's, to me, that's where the holy grail is for the value proposition for an actuary. Simply put, we turn numbers into stories and we turn stories into numbers. And that's our job. I think soft skills are undervalued a little bit. We don't have them on the exams, right? Uh, we have a communication seminar. I think most of us feel like it's important. But I'll, I'll tell a quick story. So um, I came from the insurance world for 10 years before going into tech. And in tech, it's all about stories. So I had actuaries on my team prepare a reserve review. And in the reserve review, it was maybe 100 slides. And in the 100 slides, it's here's our reserve picks. And if they don't believe this pick, then here's a reason why we, we fight against it. And here's a counter argument to that counter argument. And here's scenario B, here's scenario C. And it was not a coherent story. It was how you would maybe argue with another actuary that your pick is right. And that, that would just be disastrous. You cannot show that presentation to a reserve committee. And a lot of actuaries believe that that's, that's our secret sauce, is that we're technical. No, we have to be able to tell stories from those numbers as well, and that story has to be a coherent narrative. And all these side arguments are not part of the narrative. It's great that you prepped it. I'm happy that you looked at other LDFs or other things, but they're not relevant when you go and tell your story. And so it's just one example of things that we need to improve and we need to teach as our actuaries are growing up. They need to know how important it is to cut out some of the technical things. Yes, we know you're smart. You passed your exams. Now tell a story. Yeah, I, a soft skills, I think it should be a way of life, right? I mean, we shouldn't be having an exam on soft skills. I'm not sure a one-day exam, you know, would, would get us all, uh, you know, required on the softer side of the skills. But we should, we should kind of integrate with the curriculum for a longer duration and build it slowly over a period of time. It's more like a discipline, I feel. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Some of us have, have in different, I mean, every one of us have in different levels, at different levels. I feel it's a combination of our people skills, our communication or storytelling, however you call. One of the difficulties I felt personally, I don't know, you know maybe others can add to this, is that when I, when I see a problem, I get a lot of different ideas and perspectives. And so I would like to be the first person to tell to the other person, and another person may not know it. And, and in that context, uh, there is a there is a gap of people's skills, right? So how I how I manage that particular conversation? 
It's the, this where I have a difficulty. Let me tell an example. No? Uh, suppose if I have to set a question paper, right? And uh, say, say I qualified in pension. So, so I get a lot of ideas. Then I, I start the question paper with, say now we have the Ukraine conflict. So, uh, so if there is a petrochemical company in uh, say Turkey, then we link all of that. No, it's about bringing out our intelligence, right? Is that right? No, are we testing the students? No, I think we should we should actually be setting the question papers for the students. How do we what we ex exactly expect from them rather than putting our own intelligence over there, right? So it's a challenge. It's a challenge in terms of managing the people relationship or skill, a bit of communication as well. Just because we are more just because we are more logical and analytical, I think we are having a bit of a you know less of that. I think we should train that as part of our regular curriculum. It's, it's a long process. It doesn't come in an exam. That's my, that's my personal view. But I, I, I'd like to hear that from our other panel. Um, I, have a, I have a very dear friend who is an attorney in Jamaica. And um, after he finished his studies, the first thing that happened was that he went, got employed, was hired by this law firm. And the first thing that happened was that he was assigned a senior. So he was a junior and he was assigned a senior. So in a way, it's kind of a formal mentoring process. And I kind of, I kind of think the opportunity is here in Actual as well. Those of us who are in senior roles, if we will pass down to the juniors, what it is that makes us successful at telling the stories that Frank is talking about and so on. That, that's how I think, and I agree with you, I mean, putting something, on, uh, putting something on EQAQ inside an online module is not necessarily going to do the trick. But certainly having the understanding that this is a profession that we pass down to the next generation of actuaries, that can actually have, uh, make a big difference in this particular area. I'd like to bring something quite different than what we just talked about in terms of communication. Uh, effectively, we talked about being rational and, 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 and logic. And uh, with the world that is coming up with all the uncertainty, uh, one of the soft skills that I see is judgment and the ability to take risk. Because not everything will be defined, and uh, if you do an analytic, an analysis, and you're not sure exactly what result you're going to get. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the reaction often is, well, I don't get it, so uh, let's not take this into consideration. No, all of these things that are going to be very difficult to put a number in, it's still uh, uh, needed for the actuary to, to take a stance, even if it's feel very uncomfortable, because the worst answer when you look at a risk is to assume it's zero. It's very comforting, but it's, it's not the best answer, it's the worst. So uh, I, this is one thing that I wish that I would be more uh, comfortable with the risk, not uh, from where we are. That's okay, my point. Is it appropriate to give book recommendations at this point? Can I give book recommendations? Sure, sure. Okay. I, I'd say that's what you would call a difficult conversation, right? Uh, you can imagine in, in tech, both at Google and Uber, they don't understand insurance. And when you're telling them you have to have a reserve, it, it, it's, it's similar to the pension problem we talked about yesterday where folks just thought, why do you have all this money? You don't need all this money. You're like, oh, trust me, you will. You'll be happy that we have this money when the reserves hit. And now as the economy has changed, you actually see a lot of tech companies, uh, DoorDash, Lyft, a whole bunch of companies that didn't have enough reserves and now they're getting hit. But back to the book recommendation, if you need to have a difficult conversation, I will recommend a book called Crucial Conversations by Patterson. That's an incredibly good book. If you want one to feel, if you want a strategic thinking book, there's a book called What's Your Problem? And I think that is an amazing book. It's life-changing if you get a chance to read it. And then on presentations, I would recommend Show and Tell by Dan Rome. 
Thank you. I think uh, <laughs> this conversation has actually resulted in some essential readings. Uh, so uh, this brings us to the final theme, which is about potential for partnering opportunities. Uh, Michelin talked about partnering opportunities across professions. And I would also like to take your views on uh, what are the what is the potential for partnering among actuarial associations to close the skill gap. Well, uh, the good news is uh, I'm with the International Actuarial Association, and the purpose of the uh, International Actuarial Association is indeed to get to together all the FMAs uh, and uh, FMAs. Sorry, that's a technical term. Uh, uh, the member association, uh, which um, I mean, there are 75 uh, uh, associations uh, across the world and, and, and covering a fair bit of, of, of all the actuaries in, in, in the world. So there's lots of potential there, there's lots of ideas, but uh, uh, we all have uh, similar issues to, to, to talk about, with diff looking at it from different angles. So the idea is that this is a forum where you people can come and exchange with their uh, people from other countries in terms of how you address this issue. Uh, it's, it's a place where you also can work together, uh, writing papers, for example, where you can see the different side of, of the question and, and, and build from one another. Uh, I used to say we're a, a small profession. I know you don't like this, this idea, but honestly, there is probably more accountants in any of the big city than there's actuaries uh, in the world. So I say, well, but it's, it's it, indeed, we, sh we, n we should recognize that we're a small profession, but again, pow powerful and influential. <laughs> Certainly remind that. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we cannot afford though, with the, the, the numbers that we are, to be so split. We need to talk together and work together uh, to be able to do the, the, the best for the overall profession. Thank you. Uh. So, um, yeah, I agree by size, we're small. I don't think that we should plan on that being our long-term position. And, um, you know, I'm, I really do think the skill sets that actuaries have are so transferable, so versatile, and so needed in society, particularly in an AI world. The people who are going to be able to add value the most are the people who are going to understand this technology and to be able to articulate it. So, you know, we might, we might overtake the accountants in the future. Um, I, would, I would certainly hope to see that day. Um, so what I would say in terms of collaboration, it's great to have the International Actuarial Association connecting us, and it's great to be here today. Um, I think it's all about communication and talking to each other. So it's great to not be held back by just that and to be able to talk to each other directly because some of our associations will have certain initiatives in common, certain struggles in common. Geographically, there will be certain things that sort of challenges we face more specifically. So I think not feeling that we can't go and talk. You know, people, what I learned when I transitioned from being a chief actuary to a non-exec on a board role, um, and I thought, I don't know how, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And the best advice I received was just ask people. The thing about human nature is people like to help. Yeah, so you know, I would encourage you, and I'm sure everyone on this panel feels that way. But come and talk. Don't don't feel you can't um, talk to each other. Don't feel that we have to be stuck behind bureaucracy. Um, there's lots of ways. I mean, we're part. We're members of our institutes, but we want people to know what we've got to offer. And we want people to know, I mean, I personally believe, I've tended to be on the wider fields all of my career. And I personally believe we could even go wider and we could go more senior, et cetera. And I think the way to do that is to actually spread the word of what we do. Um, it, it, Toby might not like this, he's sitting in the audience, but as he came through customs, he was asked, um, what do you do actually? And the guy in customs was very confused. Um, I, I won't tell you what he likened it to, I'm sure you can guess. Um, but we want people to actually know what actuaries are and not have to keep explaining ourselves. So, you know, I think working together and selling that 
united image that we're supporting each other. It's not like um, combating adversarial. We support each other. We're coming together with sharing views and trying to help society. And I think that's the best thing we do. Where we're seeing helping society, I know insurance was started to help society. It doesn't always have that impression, but our work on climate, our work around COVID and the pandemic, these things remind people that we're, we're humans and we're trying to do the right thing and also progress the world um, with the knowledge of what actuaries are. Um, so in terms of, you know, actuarial organizations coming together, um, I think my view is that what, what you have here, certainly represented on the stage and, and you with the CIA and so on, um, you have different flavors and brands of the same thing. And there is nothing wrong with that. We, we, we wouldn't want all our cars to be the same car. Uh, we would want those variations. Um, you hear all the time of, of, of species that are going extinct, and we think that biodiversity is a plus, and, and so we always shudder at the thoughts that you know the, the last elephant will go away or something like that. So I think that's a situation you have here. I think it's a situation that we should cherish, we should learn from each other, uh, in terms of organizations coming together, some of you may be aware that the Casualty Actual Society and the SOA attempted that, and there were some cultural barriers that in the end, you know, caused it not to occur. And there's that as well. I mean, we are people, you, you here in India are proud of your Indian heritage and whatever that, in your, how that inures to your process there. And so I think we are, we, we're okay, we're right okay where we need to be. And um, we'd like to see the numbers grow a little bit. I'm not as optimistic as you about outnumbering, um, <laughs> outnumbering accountants. But that, that's kind of where I think I stand. I, re I really like the camaraderie. Uh, I, I, would, I would just echo, I think I agree both on the DEI, on climate, on some of the big issues that actuaries should address, that we should all work together and we should share uh, what's happening. I think. Kalpana, you and I are both presidents in training uh, versus John, who's a full president here. Uh, and <laughs> we've shared notes on that. So I think it's important for us to help one another and view ourselves as a community. Back to the original question of uh, skill set, addressing skill set gaps. I really like what John said about seniors training juniors. And if you look around you, there's a mix of very senior folks. And there are some folks who just got their fellowship. Now, I think that we really should pair up and make sure that we're learning from those who have been there before, both on soft skills, as well as other skills, as well as solving problems generally. Part of the reason I'm here and visiting universities, I'm looking for opportunities where we can help out, where the CAS can help out the same way that the IFOA and SOA have been helping out and the IA have been helping out here. And so we're really here to help and to address these gaps as well as address the bigger actual issues that we face. I think that's one thing, is just leverage your community. Shoot, I'm leveraging ChatGPT, good partner for me, because it helps me think of ideas I wouldn't have thought, for, thought of myself. Trying to do things alone is, is both lonely and sometimes very biased. Yeah, I think collaboration with the global bodies, you know, uh, we would definitely uh, need from an Indian perspective. No, we, uh, we are, I mean, I, we're small, but we are still influential and powerful, even from the Indian perspective uh, uh, in the financial sector and the insurance sector. But I think we need support in terms of uh, some of the newer developments, some of the things that are uh, the best practices elsewhere, you know, in the USA, in the CAS, in the IFOA. And so we are working closely with them. We have had discussions and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful, and they have offered us a lot of things that, that they have uh, with them currently. And we look forward to utilizing that to the best of our students and our community. Uh, we also look forward to engaging and collaborating with uh, the, the wider, I would say, uh, other professionals, 
I, I can't say non-actuarial because they're all other professionals as well. We don't use that word. No, I prefer not to use that word. I think from a research institute's perspective, uh, the technology companies, and just not the insurance industry. You know, insurance companies, we do a lot of data, but uh, we would like to partner and collaborate with uh, technology companies as well as the research bodies, especially from the Indian perspective and Indian connect. We don't want to lose our identity, though. I know I, we, we are not going to let it go to the technologies. You know, we, we are not going to become the technologies, techie. Uh, but we will have to adapt. We will have to buy the best practices from them. Collaboration. So, from an Indian perspective, we look at three prong strategies. Should I say, you know, one is the global best practices from the global actuarial bodies. The second one would be working with technology companies. And the third one would be working with uh, academic or research institutions of premier. That will help us build the academic capability. That will help us build the technology framework and also adapt to the technology. That will help us bring the best practices from the global action. I'm very happy about this uh, you know, uh, conference. All of them have, we have had fruitful discussion. They have offered their best to us. I'm thankful for that. Which is, which is absolutely true. <laughs> Uh, I'm conscious of that time, and uh, I was told by the organizers that time is a finite resource. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions here, and we have got five minutes. I'll just take one question from the audience. I'll read it out. Does the International Actuarial Association aim to bring together all actuarial societies over the world so that they can have a common curriculum and examination pattern? Uh, in, at the IA, we do have a, a syllabus recommended. This is how effectively we, we also determine uh, who we accept as member in terms of uh, quality of, of the syllabus. Uh, it is uh, though a syllabus with some flexibility uh, and because uh, the reality in each of the uh, associations are different. Some are, for example, I'm take, looking at general insurance, life, and so on. Uh, more focus on assets, and, and, and uh, so there's so much you can do, you cannot, uh, uh, and, and, and it's important then to keep that flexibility. Uh, so there is, uh, I think we'll probably need with all the things that's changing eventually to look at what we have as syllabus and potentially update it to, to be more reflective of what's happening right now. But uh, basically, that's a conversation that we'll have all, with all the, the, the association as to, uh, because this is something that we do collectively, uh, this uh, building of the syllabus. Thank you. Uh, let me take the opportunity to thank all the pa panelists here for a very engaging conversation. And thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, I request Dr. Sriram uh, to hand over a token of appreciation from our side to the, pan uh, to the panelists. Dr. Sriram would like to hand over to Ms. Micheline Dion. Open for Miss Kalpana Shah. A token for Mr. John Robinson.
Token for Mr. Chang. And a token for Mr. Arun Nachalam. I would request Mr. K. Subramaniam to please come on stage and hand over a token of appreciation to Dr. K. Sriram. Thank you all.